Hey everybody, it's Brian, keeping Walt and Disney. Glad to have you all joined in. We're going to be talking about Darby O'Gill and the little people. So we're gathered here at Rathcoen Arms. I've got my stout, and uh, that's okay because well, singing's no sin and drinking's no crime. If you only if you have one drink only, just one at a time. So <laughs> pace yourselves. So for the next 90 minutes or so, we'll be talking about Darby O'Gill and the Little People, one of my favorite Disney films. I hope it's one of your favorites, too. It, isn't it great? It's just totally magical. So I'm going to invite Jared to join us. Great old time talking about leprechauns. Stout and like uh, carriages and banshees and death coaches. <laughs> Good, how are you? How you doing, Jared? Me I'm too. hanging in there. I I literally am hanging in there. <laughs> it's been a crazy week or a crazy last couple of weeks, and well, I will really look forward to doing these with you, and and uh, it's kind of like just gives me something to look forward to. And hopefully everybody out there yeah, as no, well. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's been crazy too, but it is nice to um, take a break and and do this. Yeah. yeah. Well. Uh, oops. Let me see here. I'm saying hi to everybody. Thanks for joining in. Feel free to drop a comment. We like to read the comments, and if you have questions about the the film and and you want to share what you like about it and your favorite scenes, we will. Uh, answer those all in due course because we like to introduce the film and kind of share our little goodies that we have from our collection and uh how many times have you seen oh, yeah. Darby O'Gill and the little people else. yeah everybody Jared you you always get the first question um you know <laughs> I will be honest with you Darby O'Gill was not one that I watched a million times growing up um I watched I've watched it more since I was yeah. an adult. So I've maybe seen it, I don't know, mm -hmm. 10 times. I'm probably about the same, 10 to 15, because this isn't one that my no. dad would show us as kids. I think he thought it was either too scary or we wouldn't understand it because of the Irish uh, accents and uh, mm -hmm. uh, or mm -hmm. the dialect. And really it wasn't um it wasn't until maybe 10 years ago that i really started getting into it and then watching it like every saint patrick's day so um cc worthy has a question where else can we watch the movie other than disney plus well uh you could buy the dvd which is here uh i think it's been yeah, released on blu-ray as well it on blu-ray uh maybe it was last okay. year mm -hmm. and you probably could watch it on uh, amazon prime or yeah, you can, apple tv you can rent or purchase they it may... on itunes yeah uh, i do know that because that's right. where i purchased it you could also watch it on betamax or VHS. <laughs> you could, or yeah find a vhs copy or <laughs> find one on ebay Dust off your handy dandy VHS player or VCR. Sure. Well, maybe know. it was released on Laserdisc. I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, it probably wasn't well, because actually, if it I'm was, you'd have it, it right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Cater says, uh, yeah, who wants to have nightmares about a banshee <laughs> for the rest of their life? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a banshee nightmare every March 17th evening <laughs> those are scary it's legit scary look what i just the banshee found. here <laughs> oh i do you have, have it available there it is Disc. wow so i think we've exhausted all the the viewing possibilities there cc worthy or if you have a 16 millimeter <laughs> copy of the film you could probably like pull the projector out of the attic and, and watch it that way too or 
you could do what Jared did a couple weekends ago and tell oh. us about it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm very confused. I was very confused. No, um, <laughs> it was actually last weekend. I actually got to go. Yeah, I got to go was sit it? on the big okay. screen here in LA at the new Beverly Cinema and they showed a nice Technicolor print of it. And uh, it was really great to see it on the big screen, not only to see it on the big screen, um, but to see it with a group of people. It's always, it's always a different experience than when you're just sitting there watching it at home, especially when you're watching a movie that you've seen several times before. You know what I mean? Mm, right, what, yeah. <clears throat> uh-huh. I've done that before, not with Disney films, but I remember watching mm -hmm. Back to the Future, the first one. In a, in a theater like that it really is <laughs> it was a who fun and what uh, yeah. my favorite well my favorite part of it there was a trailer at the beginning of it for the gnome mobile and uh, um it was such a trippy trailer <laughs> you know it's totally disney totally 60s and mm -hmm. i think if people in the audience like they were just laughing at it they were laughing so hard at it and i just wonder if they've even heard of the movie or if they're just laughing at how, how goofy it is <laughs> Well, hopefully it generated some interest it. in it. I know it's your favorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I was really trying to get out there to meet with you and Celebration Disney. I think Jim's in the chat. Yeah, I got the And you guys saw it together, uh, Celebration right? Celebration Disney, yeah. which is a great account. If you, uh, if you don't follow Celebration Disney, follow them. Yeah, please do that. Uh, jot it down in your notes here and then do that after the stream. Go follow, follow Jim. He's great. Um, yeah, so let's kind of, we'll, we'll talk more about your experience, uh, here in a little bit, but, um, let us proceed with our little, uh, goodies. So we've seen your laser disc and your Betamax and VHS. We want to give us a close Not up of sure. those covers because they, they always have really fun covers, but <laughs> like, Okay, so, it's a standard so that's like a standard cover, cover yeah. that we see a and lot. I, you know, yeah. they did release it a couple other times on VHS. Disney did um, in the 90s, I believe. This, of course, is the 80s version. Uh, and I think all of the, like, Laserdisc, VHS, I think it's pretty much all the same. Mm -hmm. Pretty basic. Okay, basic, pretty, pretty, pretty close. close. Yeah, the, the DVD copy has a nice photo of King Brian and then of course the the lovers the romantic the couple. only <laughs> but the only bummer about film. the DVD from what I remember is is full screen correct is it the widescreen version uh well I, I it, it is it says it's um presented as originally filmed in the full screen hmm. that aspect ratio so four to three so that uh, is a little suspect there, I guess. I mean, it's not a, uh, it wasn't no. a cinema scope it's, or I mean, anything no, it, like it's that. It's true that it could be like that, but I do find it a little suspect because I don't remember it being in that aspect ratio when I went to see it in the theater this week. Yeah, because you probably saw the 16 millimeter or whatever, maybe, mm -hmm. no, th 35 millimeter version. Yeah. Well, I don't know. So, all right, I've got a couple things. I've, oh, you still have one thing hiding well, behind your uh, uh, yes, laser I disc a, there. I think yours right? looks better. So, if you want to show yours off, no, no. mine's in bad shape. So, welcome everybody that's joined. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, Mystic Parks, what's up? How you doing? Thanks for uh, joining. Oh yeah, okay. You've got the see. Mine's split on the top. Somebody. <laughs> yeah, somebody but I don't have that tape. tape. Pretty, pretty old. I haven't done anything with it, but yeah. It's yeah. the Darby O'Gill album. The story of... Let's also have an uh, ugly tear there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. I'm so sorry. Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a hard album to come across. So if you do come across one in a thrift store or wherever, grab it because... I see them selling for over a hundred dollars yeah, on eBay regularly. Store, and um, I, was, I was bummed that it yeah. uh, 
that I ha I'm going to have to sneeze again on mic. But I was bummed that I had the tape, but then I was like, I never see it anywhere. So I need to pick it up. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, well, it's a great one. And, and as I always do with the albums, if you send me a message afterwards with your email address, I'll add you to a Dropbox account where I drop the audio for this album because it's never been released on CD. It's not available for download anywhere. And uh, what's interesting about this album is it's actually got Darby O'Gill is voiced by Arthur Shields and Pat O'Malley <laughs> is King Brian. <laughs> so I, some, someone in the chat's going to have to help me out with Arthur Shields, what he's done, but I do know that Pat O'Malley is uh, uh, has done several things for Disney. Like one of my favorites is Perkins and Spin and Marty, but he, he's done a ton of things for Disney. So he's a familiar voice that you'll hear, but Arthur Shields, I'm not sure what he's done. I didn't have time to look him up, but that's a weird thing with some of the Disneyland records is that they won't always have the actual folks from the film be on the story. Yeah. albums <laughs> and it's either contractual or uh, a time constraint it could be a number of reasons why they don't have that i looked it up and as far as like the, the movies or tv that uh he's done for that arthur shields has done for disney uh was just the hardy boys the mystery of the applegate treasure he was Bowles. Oh, yeah, he was yeah, in that. Bowles, right. ex-gardener. Oh, that's right. Wait, Arthur wait, Shields. Arthur yeah. Shields you're talking about? He was, was the gardener? Well, was he the, the villain you know, honestly, in that I one? No, it just says that the role was Bowles, ex-gardener. Bowles. Okay. Yeah, Jim's right. He Paddle Valley. He's done a ton of voices. Cyril Proudbottom, from uh, anybody know what that what, what what film or animated film Cyril Proudbottom is from? <laughs> Took me a while to get that out of there. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Uh, I can't even talk today. But while you're thinking about that, I also have this cool uh, gold key comic of Darby O'Gill cool. and the Little People. Yeah, and, and all these are, it's just the story of the film. You got some cool, like, look at this vintage Matchbox ad. <laughs> it just goes through the film in comic form. So it's it's not a different story. It's just a retelling of the film in uh, in comics. Oh. Get, oh, look at that. Oh. And, and an ad for the Hot Wheels Supercharger race set. <laughs> That's cool. What's on the Jim inside is correct. The cover? Of course, Jim's correct. Yeah. Uh, an ad for a Christmas thing. So I guess this was released around Christmas time. I can't tell. But, well, anyways. Uh, and then I've got the lobby card set that we'll just kind of go through as we talk about the film. So I'll share that with you here in a, in a bit. So uh, I'll, I will uh, go through some of the history. So I, I had to do the majority of the research because uh, Jared just started a new job and you're like yes, working like a madman right now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we just agreed that I, that I would take care of it this time and he would join in and provide, uh, share more of his experience watching the film on the big screen. And then of course, when we, talk about our favorite scenes and get kind of goofy with this film. Cause it's funny <laughs> and it's magical and it's, it's fantastical. It's magical. Oh my gosh. It's whimsical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. I won't get into the what's up with that. <laughs> All right. Because I'm not that quick on my feet. So, it does have somebody named Pony. I love his last name, Sugru. Boy, my name's Pony Sugru. Goofy. So this film, 
album was uh, released back in 1959. And uh, on my Instagram, I shared a photo from the uh, premiere, the world premiere, which occurred in Dublin on June 24th. And then in Los the Angeles. Day my birth, the day after say, my birthday. Say that again. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? June 23rd? Yeah. <laughs> Are there any Disney? Films oh, yeah. that have oh, been released on your birthday. Shrunk the kids and the Happiest Millionaire. Wow. Okay. I need to see what Disney films have been released on my birthday, which is exactly two months April before 23rd. yours. Oh. Isn't that the day? April twenty third. Yeah. Birthday. <laughs> I th think so. Yeah, and I think Richard Nixon too. There's there's a couple folks. So June. 24th, 1959, uh, the, the U.S. premiere was a couple years later. It, it did pretty good at its initial release, 2.6 million. Not bad. Uh, the re-release did almost as good. I think there were some issues with this film when it was uh, released. Like parents, uh, the kiddos who attended this movie had a tough mm. time understanding <laughs> what was being said on screen because... Uh, all the actors were yeah. Irish or Scottish. And so in 69, when they re-released it, they, they dubbed over the film with a uh, less uh, thick accent. <laughs> so, and you'd think they would earn more money, but it actually went down. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? So it was directed by Robert Stevenson, and this was his third film. Uh, he previously did Johnny Tremaine and Old Yeller, and he went on to do a whole bunch of great... I mean, Robert Stevenson is probably the most renowned Disney film director. Just almost yeah, everything I he think, did was I awesome. Think he did Nomobile. He did. He did Black... Yeah. I think so. I know he did Mary Poppins Blackbeard and The Ghost, Love Bug and some of the and giant Sticks, films, Blackbeard's Ghost. Miss Adventures of Merlin Jones, Eater. That Darn Cat, Monkey's Uncle. He did a lot of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, he was just a great director to work with. And, and he didn't have that chip on his shoulder that like a, a lot of other studio directors had because, uh, you know, Walt was mm -hmm. in charge of his movies <laughs> when he was around. And Mr. Stevenson was always willing and uh, to cater to Walt's requests and, and never thought twice about changing things around if Walt didn't like it. So it was always very uh, supportive of, of Walt's requests and very nice with, the, with his team of actors and actresses. So, uh, it's the screenplay was written by Lawrence Edward Watkin and we haven't really talked about him much, but he did quite a bit of things that we all know about, like all of the um, British films. So this was kind of like the last one in a long line of British films, but it's different in that it was, uh, we'll get to it. Uh, it's a little different than the rest of the British films. And so we'll talk about that, but he did treasure Island, the story of Robin hood and his merry men, the sword and the rose Rob Roy, the Highland rogue. Uh, he snuck a true life adventure in there with Beaver Valley and then the light in the forest. And uh, one of my favorite movies, 10 who dared, and the, uh, the Biscuit Eater. And, and he also, this is what I came across that was the most interesting to me, is that he wrote the book, Marty Markham. I've never, Marty, I've never heard of Marty So th does anybody know the book Marty Markham and what uh, connection that has to Disney? I have. So that's a, that's a great Marty trivia Markham. question. Nope, never heard of it. Marty Markham. He produced The Great Locomotive Chase, and interesting, another interesting thing about him, he had a failed attempt at writing a Walt Disney biography. <laughs> so I guess the editor said it was too truthful and too boring, so they, he, that you project just was love scratched. to read but, uh, throwaway uh, books like that? I know, like, I wonder what made it too boring, so... Jim's on a roll here. The book Marty Markham was the basis of the Disneyland cereal or the Mickey Mouse Club cereal, Spin and Marty. So he got it. Yeah. 
That is pretty I, awesome. I thought that was cool. And so back to uh, Darby O'Gill and the Little People. He uh, wrote the screenplay based on the stories of H.T. Kavanaugh, who wrote a couple of books titled Darby O'Gill and the Good People and Darby O'Gill Tales. So continuing on with this great history, this, this, this history of this film is just fascinating. So Walt actually thought up the film back in 1947 and 48 when he took a trip to Ireland. He, him and he, several of his artists uh, traveled there and you know they were just doing their research on, on Irish culture, Gaelic history and things like that. And think of, Walt always knew he wanted to do a story about leprechauns because of course they're magical, fantastical creatures and that's kind of like right in line with what Walt likes to produce. And so really wanted to produce like a fantasy adventure film starring leprechauns. And so uh, the, after his trip, he, he announced the title of the film was gonna be Three Wishes based on uh, a Watkins script that would be live action and animation. So uh, of course he was gonna try to animate the leprechauns. Um, but it was not produced and it was kind of shelved. And, and, and about 10 years later, Watkin adapted, he came across those Kavanaugh stories about Darby O'Gill. And uh, Walt remembered that he had tabled this. And it's interesting because the animation thing kind of fell through and he didn't really know how they were gonna do it because he, he decided he wanted to do live action leprechauns, live action big people, live action little people. And it's not really uh, mentioned anywhere where, in the research that I came across, but I think in the back of his mind, he knew that he didn't have like the tools or the technology available or the people, uh, the expertise in the studio to make a film where they could have live action big people and little people, of course, because leprechauns Wait, aren't, aren't real. <laughs> so. The way Walt talks. I know. <laughs> well, I know. The way Walt talked about it and the marketing, the whole marketing of this film, which I'll, we'll get to, is uh, he makes it believe that, that, that it is real, right? So, uh, so in 56, Watkin adapted the Kavanaugh stories and Walt jumped right back in to the research. He, he uh, went back to Ireland, and according to what I read, he actually studied Gaelic folklore for three months at a Dublin library and met with a traditional Gaelic oh, wow. storyteller. Like, uh, yeah, I can't. How do you pronounce like the, the anybody know how to pronounce that? <laughs> Suchi? A Saint Saintchi? Like, they. I'm, I'm not good with Gaelic. Uh, so. I'm terrible at Gaelic, <laughs> I promise. Yeah, I mean, I learned a little bit watching the film and doing some research. So I, I'm glad that you did. Cause <laughs> like you said, I have not done much research on this one. I apologize. But I thought it was great that he just kind of dove into this research for a, for three months at the Dublin Library. And so... While he was over there, uh, of course, they decided to um, cast the film with the uh, actual Scottish Irish actors. So in February of 58, Walt, uh, in the middle of casting, they changed the film to the current title, which is, of course, Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Walt originally, originally wanted Barry Fitzgerald to play Darby. And, and uh, if you know Barry Fitzgerald, he, I think he was in the, the film. Have you ever seen The Quiet Man? No. I, with uh, John Wayne not. and Maureen O'Hara? Oh, oh, great movie. <laughs> uh, he was in that. And so he was known to Walt to be a, a leading person for Darby. But later, he went with uh, Albert Sharp, who played Darby, because he saw him in a Broadway play called Finian's Rainbow. Uh, he was retired at the time Walt asked him. So he... I guess Walt had this crazy effect of folks uh, bringing him out of retirement. Yep. 
to yeah, come didn't do he films. Do, uh, didn't he do that with, uh, his... I don't know remember who the actress's name was, but on um, The Moon Spinners? He brought the actress back to play uh... the, the woman on the boat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pola, Pola Negri. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also in Mary Poppins, the, oh, yes. the bird yeah. lady. Uh, she was retired, and Walt got her to come back. Of course, a smaller role. If anybody remembers her name, it's escaping me at the moment. Um, I can't you, remember did her name. Did they say at all why it went, he went with little people and not leprechauns in the title? Uh, I don't know. I've always thought no, that I was didn't a little see anything. strange. <laughs> not the fact that the title is strange, but for the fact that you hear the word leprechaun and it just like people know exactly what you mean by leprechaun. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. and if you're wanting to, you, to get the kids in, I always thought that was a little strange. Although, you know, it would yeah. be, I always know this as dark. Darby will go the little people, so it would be strange if it was called that now, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Jim. Jane Darwell, the bird woman, right. And uh, yeah, I think Miss Caters says that his accent is worse, so mm -hmm. talking about Barry Fitzgerald. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Albert Sharp's accent is pretty tough, but uh, I always watch the movie with the subtitles on. But, you know, after watching it several times, it, it kind of grows on. I, I yeah, think I I, I'm used say, to I it. I didn't have a problem watching it without, I mean, there wasn't subtitles at the theater. Yeah. The person I have the hardest time understanding is the uh, pony's rough, rough mom. One. Yeah, she is a rough one. <laughs> yeah. So, but she's, uh, we'll talk about her here in a sec. So, uh, uh, he got, uh, he got, Albert Sharp, and for King Brian, oh, originally he wanted Barry Fitzgerald to to play both Darby and King Brian, but Walt decided to split the part between two actors, Albert Sharp, and then uh, he was watching a pantomime show and came across Jimmy O'Day, who uh, plays King Brian. So he picked him, and of course Janet Monroe was uh, just signed to a contract and uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how they came across her later, later. and then of course uh, Sean Connery came over from Fox uh, to, to work on this film and going back to like this being the last film in a string of, of British films that, that Walt was working on of course we all know like Walt had all that money over in Great Britain during the war and it, he couldn't take it back to America and spend it there. So a lot of his films in the fifties uh, were created over there in Great Britain. So like the ones that I mentioned that, that Watkin had written like uh, Treasure Island, Sword Robin of the Rose, um, Robin Hood and, and, and Rob Roy. Uh, um, Darby O'Gill was actually not filmed over there in Ireland, which makes this film mm. even more spectacular when you think about it, because <laughs> none of it was shot on location like all those other British films were. Even Kidnapped, I think, was a 1960 film that was shot over there, I believe. But, but um, he, the film was entirely shot on the back lot beginning in May 1958, and some of the location work was done at a couple of ranches that's in the San Fernando so Valley, crazy. Albertson Ranch. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you've been there. Is Albertson there. Ranch still around? I heard from a friend that it's still there and they have some of the crocs, the croc of gold oh, really? crocs that are just lying around. <laughs> Out there. Yeah. He showed me some pictures. I don't know if it was there or the gold milk been, ranch, but those crocs the that they ranch. used to. Yeah, we filmed. A, you you have been there. Filmed uh, part of the show there. Oh, that's awesome. So, during the the during the um, I, I want to go there so bad. It'd be great because a lot of our mm -hmm. favorite films were filmed right there. 
old yeller follow me boys tons just too many to even rattle off so during the filming walt had this like really kind of unique way to market the film <laughs> do, do you um, do you know anything bit. about this he had okay well he I'll had that fill special. in the blanks go ahead special right yeah. and we alluded earlier to the fact that he from the beginning i feel and correct me if i'm wrong he always wanted to make sure that everybody knew that leprechauns were quote unquote real so he always talked about the leprechaun sure. as a real entity mm -hmm. uh when it came to, to this film because if you think about it and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but the, the special effects in this film are unbelievable for 1959. And there are still, they are still tricks mm -hmm. that are used today in films. Um, there are directors yeah. today. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Groundbreaking. Um, I think it was uh, 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 Peter Jackson it absolutely loves the, the special effects in this film. And it was very inspired by them because of how great and they they look so good they hold up yeah they're great i mean uh we'll, yeah we'll, we'll we'll talk more about it but i know m movies that we enjoy today like lord of the rings uh use techniques that yep. were used in this the film -mobile. so yeah walt wanted the <laughs> the no mobile yeah. walt wanted the audience to know that leprechauns were real. And so on May 29th, they released this episode called I Captured the King of the Leprechauns on his uh, Walt Disney Presents television show. This was about a month prior to release. And Walt Disney did this a lot, like a month, a couple of months before a film was released, or sometimes even after he would do a lot of behind the scenes, kind of a, a one hour commercial, so to speak, to, to sell the film because he knew that television was the way to to bring his mm -hmm. the things he was working on to to an audience because he had a pretty captive audience on Sunday evenings, so just genius to to make these programs which were not just they were commercials but they were like immensely entertaining, including this one. So just a quick summary, Walt, you know he. He, he does his, it's like a 48 minute lead in really, because Walt is on this special throughout. It's really well, did, entertaining. Uh, but he- uh, Something similar with uh, 20,000 Leagues in the Sea, I believe too, right? Uh, yeah, it was a yeah, show so called Operation Undersea. You're, you're right, mm -hmm. it wasn't anything, yep. this wasn't new, but he did do this a lot. No. Yeah, he, he did this with a lot of the live action films that came out in the smart after his show went on the air. So have you guys seen looks like Miss Caters has seen it. It's a great special. Uh it it, it opens up with him saying that he want he's always wanted to make a picture from Ireland cuz he's half Irish and uh he has a friend by the name of Pat O'Brien who's full Irish and so he wants to consult him on on what he should do. Of course, he wanted to make a picture about leprechauns. And so Pat O'Brien's whole thing is like, well, you need to go to Ireland and go find the real leprechauns. And Walt's like, <laughs> really? They're real? <laughs> so he was sold. Of course, now this is all in the context of, of a television mm -hmm. show for entertainment. So just use common sense as a viewer. But <laughs> uh so he tells Walt to go to Ireland, find the real ones. And so Walt, you know, you see him get on a plane on Irish airlines, flying over to Ireland and, and he meets with a, a, a librarian and he tells him the story. This is a, I didn't know this, but the story of how the le leprechauns came to tell Ireland. Me. Have you heard this story before? Um, he, he, uh, basically, there was this war between the the angels from heaven and the angels of hell, right? and they were battling it out. And the leprechauns originally were part of the angels in heaven group. You know, they, all this little artwork they show with with King Brian having wings and things. Well, during the battle, I mean, they're so small they tried to join in because the they were beating each up, beating each other up with rocks and picking up rocks and throwing them. 
but the leprechauns were like too small to even pick up a rock. And so they, what they did was they went and hid under this mountain. And uh, after the battle was over and the angels from heaven won, uh, the, the archangel Gabriel, I think it was, that came and said, hey, uh, you guys didn't help out. So you're not really worthy of going to, to hell, you know, but you're also not really worthy of going to heaven. <laughs> like, uh, and so we're going to do something else with you. Like, and, you know, King Brian's like, well, send us to a place where we can dance and, and have fun and, and have all these fun diversions that, you know, leprechauns like to, you know, enjoy. And so uh, he said, okay, we'll send you down to earth. And he kicked them out. And then for two years, they fell down to earth until they came across this little island called Ireland. And uh, they decided to call that home. Hmm. <laughs> Isn't that? That is yeah, interesting. interesting story. Never in my life have I heard that. Well, I know I take it back. I have heard it just now from you. Yeah. Oh, am I pronouncing leprechauns wrong? Leprechauns. 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 Thanks, Gary. <laughs> I don't know. I, I pronounce it like I see it. Leprechauns? <laughs> leprechauns? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> leprechauns? I, I'm going with leprechauns, but... <laughs> So the librarian tells them, hey, you know, if you really want to go find leprechauns, go to this town called Rathcullen and go talk to Darby O'Gill and he'll take you to King Brian. And so he meets with uh, Darby and he takes him to see King Brian and Walt convinces both of them to uh, come film a movie with him. <laughs> and then throughout the special, you see clips of the film and, and you, you start to see that relationship that Darby and King Brian have, you know, those that best friends like who are rivals frenemy? kind of relationship a frenemy yeah just worthy adversaries of uh you know sharp wits uh singing songs having a toast and a a bit of po pochin you know and <laughs> they have a good old time so after that is all done, said and done, Walt goes back to, uh, to, to L.A. and meets up with Pat and says, hey, you know, I got to meet the leprechauns. I met King Brian. He's going to come do the movie. And he said I could use all of his leprechaun pals. And this is when Pat's kind of like, <laughs> I think he was pulling a fast one on Walt from the beginning. <laughs> but, but when Walt comes back and tells him that they're real, the, the special ends with Pat looking at the camera and saying, this I got to see. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just a, a great little commercial for this and it film. Was a, it's a full and, hour. Is it a full hour? And yeah. It, wow. That's a it's a one hour episode. Well, it's, it's, uh, one, all these Disneyland episodes were, were, uh, one hour with, you know, ads. So 48, usually 48 to 49 that's minutes. So crazy. So um, I'll die digress for just a second the 48 to 49 minutes back then so there was 10 minutes of commercials and now the episodes are like 41 <laughs> to 43 minutes with a lot more oh, with even more commercials. commercials now so yeah <laughs> well and then i well I did a couple of other things uh to um to convince the audience like uh there was one, like when you watch the film, the opening credits, there's a, uh, a little thank you message on the screen that says, my thanks to King Brian of Nakhnashiga mm -hmm. and his leprechauns, whose gracious cooperation made this picture possible, Walt Disney. So if I'm a kid sitting in the audience and I see that on there or my parents read it to me, I'm mm -hmm. like, wow, they're real. <laughs> so they're real. I mean, I, I think they're real. I, I, I trust Walt, but, uh, <laughs> so again, this film was entirely shot on, uh, locate not, uh, at the studios and a couple of ranches in the San Fernando Valley area, but there's one gentleman or two actually that really make you feel like you're in Ireland. And that's mm -hmm. Peter Ellenshaw, mm -hmm. who that was, 
he succeeded in making everyone believe like I've had friends who watch this movie and when I, and when they learn that um, it was shot at the Disney studios, they're just baffled, flabbergasted, like no way. They didn't go to Ireland to do it's this. One of the, it's <laughs> one of the most convincing of the, mm -hmm. that time frame. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those British films, like Peter Ellenshaw is from uh, Great Britain. And uh, he did all the map painting for all those British films. Of course, he was the natural choice to come in and work on this. And uh, him and, and our, our friend Eustace Lysett, or Eustace Lysett, he and him, they did the photographic effects. And so this is really like, I wanted to talk a little bit about the movie magic uh, that we see here because they have, they have two major things to, to take care of in this film, right? They've got to convince the audience that leprechauns are real and they have to film this all on the back lot. So how are they going to do that? <laughs> so how are they going to make Darby O'Gill and King Brian, who is supposedly like a 21 inch little person, <laughs> make it look like they're talking to each other and interacting with each other. And so, uh, and then how do they convince the audience that this all took place in England? And so we've talked, tons about Peter Ellenshaw and the map paintings. And so just uh, do you kind of, do you, do you know how that works? The map paintings? Cause we really haven't talked too much about the, the art or the well, what they do science is, behind it. Don't they, they film it, but they film it with a pane of glass. Uh, they film it with a pane of, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I'm so wrong with this. But anyway, don't they film it with a pane of glass? Yeah, a pane of glass yeah. between the camera has he and the set. It beforehand, right? Or does he paint it after? Well, they they do all of the uh, they do all of the research before, so they have so all like the all prep the work done and stuff. And so when they're actually, yeah, so when when they go to film the scene, the the pane is is. Uh, is uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading some of these comments here. Not in England, Gary. What do you mean, not in England? Okay, but uh, most of the prep work was done before, so they didn't have to waste a whole lot of time when they went to film a shot. And so, uh, I I don't know for sure if if Peter had painted everything prior to the shot, or did he just really quickly do it? Because a lot of these shots, mm -hmm. they're not really on screen for very long. They're, they're just like, you know, a few seconds. Most of them are in, in the, they are backgrounds or big wide shots or, or a, like for one example, it was like the, the village at the beginning. Like that's, uh, that's one of the um, really cool map painting. I'm trying to find a lobby card that, that well, has a nice example like, to use here. See. Well, this one is this one is really kind of so this 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 photo right here is the uh, set. This, this is uh, on the in one of the sound stages mm -hmm. where this was done, and so everything above this line right here, above here, like if you can't, I can't see my finger. So above here is like the ceiling of the sound stage. So you use like you know, lots of equipment up there, lights and everything. And so above this white line here is to, Pete Ellenshaw would paint that to make it look like the, the uh, top ceiling of this cave right, right, <laughs> where right. they're all dancing in. So yeah, and Miss Caters has one, like the castle ruins up the hill, like Nock Nashiga, that's all matte painting. The spire on the church in, in the I town when, of Rathcolan is a map they're painting. In the hills the, when uh, Sean Connery and Janet Monroe are in the hills and she's running away from him, like flirting. Mm -hmm. The you know they're filming that in Burbank, <laughs> in yeah. Burbank or the San Fernando. Those mm -hmm. mountains aren't <laughs> like that. So yep. yeah, and he paints all that. So that's really what convinced everybody. And his artistry is just so incredibly beautiful that it, it really tricks the viewer into thinking that 
that they're really there in Ireland on, on a location. So uh, the other thing that they had to do is convince the audience that Darby O'Gill, here's the, one of the great photos of their inter interaction here, is, is a 21 inch leprechaun compared to the full size Darby. And this is just fascinating how they did this. And you can watch this as a, on a, a special feature mm -hmm. on the DVD. So I'm just gonna read a couple things here. But if you have this DVD, you could watch the episode. It's about 10 minutes, but um, as Darby, let's see if I have the picture of him. I thought I did. Nope. Oh, this scene too, right here. So, well, when Darby first comes in to the leprechaun, like the, the leprechaun cave where they're all in there, uh, Darby's actually on an elevated set as he walks, you know, you know that scene where mm -hmm. Darby walks in mm -hmm. between the leprechauns? He's actually, he's on an elevated platform on the soundstage and all the leprechauns are down at the bottom. And so what Peter Ellenshaw did was put an angled mirror on that platform where Darby was standing and angled it to a way where you could see the leprechauns on the ground in the mirror. So the camera was pointed at the mirror where he could see the two rows of leprechauns. And then what he did was he actually scraped the reflective surface off of the mirror to make it look like glass again. So it would see through Darby and then he would walk through, you know, Oh and my they God. would film that. It's just amazing how they did that. <laughs> and, and of course, the camera sees everything in two dimensions, so can't really distinguish how far objects are away from each other. This is really more evident in the, the scene where, they're play, where the wishing song takes place. So to get the effect of Darby or King Brian being smaller than, than uh, Darby is uh, they, would always, they would split the set in half. And they would station King Brian like four times farther away from the camera than Darby. And everything on King Brian's side of the set was built four times larger than it actually was to make it look, mm -hmm. look like him being little, right? So, you know, there's a scene where you see the sword, you know, that's, it's a big, huge sword, four times regular size. Just amazing how they did all that. And so when they would talk to each other like this, in this scene, Darby's actually right in front of the camera and King Brian is like way back there. So they would have like mm -hmm. sight lines mm -hmm. or yeah. eye, what do they call it? Uh, eye lines and station points to look at and then just act it out like they were talking, like the person was actually there at that station point. So just really cool. And there was a lot of that going on throughout the film. And then there were like a lot of mechanical effects, like when Darby puts uh, King Brian in the bag. <laughs> it's like a little air-driven puppet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. All kinds of great stuff. And, and then the Banshee and the, the, uh, the Death Coach, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Costa Bauer Death Coach. That was all like um, color negative images, just spruced up to make them look like apparitions. So just Peter Ellenshaw and Eustace Lysa just totally... Well, but <laughs> I feel this. like Walt Disney and, always had vision, uh, and then he just trusted the people to fulfill it. And sometimes it would seem impossible, mm -hmm. but they would always do it. <laughs> they would find a way to do it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's another example of Walt's genius, like, to not produce that film back in 48, 49, because he knew he could make it the way he envisioned it he i think he saw this whole thing in his mind but needed the expertise and after all of the british films you know once he saw the the expertise of pete ellenshaw and and his other effects folks it's like wow now i can unshelf this darby o'gill film and then we could do it and he it's just a great example of walt having the right people around the studio just because he knew he recognized talents in, in his folks. I mean, he, 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 would, he would assign folks to jobs that, <laughs> that they themselves didn't even think they could do, but Walt had faith in them. And 
God, just mm-hmm. just the magic that he could, you know, get out of these people. Uh, and then just lastly, the music, uh, Oliver Wallace wrote the score. And of course, the songs, uh, Pretty Irish Girl, which is like just a great song. And then the Wishing Song. And uh, uh, Watkin, who wrote the screenplay, actually wrote the lyrics for both of those songs. So uh, that's that's pretty much the history of the film went a little long but we had to talk about some of those crazy special effects that just really is like what draws people to this film i think when they get done when they reflect on this film i think they remember mostly how fantastical it was as opposed to like what the plot yes i would agree it's <laughs> the, the the story cuz i i'm always so mesmerized by what i'm watching on screen that I forget the plot points and uh, those don't really stick with me as much as like the amazing visual effects. <laughs> so, so each time I watch the film, it's like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't really, is that why, uh, why uh, Darby <laughs> O'Gill had to leave the manor house and the, the, the station house or the gatehouse? Oh yeah. <laughs> so the cast, of course, we talked about Darby O'Gill um, played by Albert Sharp. That was his only Disney credit, unless you count the I Captured the King of the Leprechauns. <laughs> um, he was in the musical Brigadoon, which I need to see. I was going to try to watch that before this show. I've uh, actually I've never did this seen show. The, the show of it, uh, but I have seen the movie. I enjoy it. Yeah, I think he was in the oh, film. it's a good one. It's Brigadoon. One. Fiona's father. Yeah. So I need to watch that because I know Sh- Sid Charisse is in that. And that's like one of my daughter's favorite dancers. Uh, Katie O'Gill was played by Janet Monroe, And this was her first film for Disney. Um, they found her. Uh, she auditioned for this part. Um, already a very popular TV personality in, uh, in, um, in, in uh, Ireland. So she, she got the part and signed a five-year contract to do a few films. And so what are some of the films that, what are some of your favorite films in the audience will ask that your, your favorite Janet um, Monroe films? Well, I, um, I actually like them all. She isn't, she wasn't in a whole lot of them, but I've actually enjoyed them all. I like horse masters. Yeah. She was a little different character, more of a, more of a, uh, how do I say this without? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was not as nice as she was in uh, in in uh, this film, Third Man on the Mountain. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew Coop got one, and then of course she was Roberta in Swiss Family. Um, yeah, <laughs> but Horse Masters. If you haven't seen it, uh, highly recommend it. It's got Tommy Kirk and Annette. And uh, a great Sherman Brothers song, and it's, it's on my uh, YouTube channel. It's one of my favorite. So go to Keeping Sherman Brothers songs. The Strumman song. It also yeah, has the Strumman song. Who played, um, yep. Princess Mombi on Return to Oz. Yes. Oh really? <laughs> younger, a, a, a younger yeah. version of her, right? Is is she one of the students yep. in the? Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So Janet. Monroe, we love her. She didn't finish her contract with Disney, and unfortunately, she died at yeah, a really did. young age. But we we love her in the films that she's in. She uh, Miss Cater says she has a tongue that could she clip does. a head. She does. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many. One, that's that right. got a big she laugh does. at the theater. I will tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just love her interactions with Michael McBride, our next actor, who he says, well, actually, my name is Michael. Well, I have to call you Mr. McBride because I've only known you for one day, Mr. (laughs) McBride. (laughs) Yeah, she does have a a sharp tongue. Ooh, and she, she can't stand when anybody speaks bad about her father. She'll give you that death stare, like the banshee's coming for you. If you say one bad word about Darby and his it's leprechaun true. stories. <laughs> she gives you the evil eye. So Michael McBride, of course, played by Sean Connery, his only Disney film. 
And one little fun thing that I, I read was that Albert Broccoli, is that his name, the director of some uh, of the Bond films? Possibly. <laughs> yeah, his last name's Broccoli. So uh, when he was looking for James Bond, he came across this film and showed it to his wife. And she said, that's James Bond right mm -hmm. there. <laughs> so so uh, his little role here uh, led him to greater fame and fortune, of course. <laughs> uh, King Brian Connors was played by Jimmy O'Day, and this was his, his only Disney credit. And, and boy, he, Walt really picked the right person for this. So. Yep. Oh, and uh, yeah, the Michael McBride, his only singing role, the only singing role for Sean Connery. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think it was terrible. I didn't think it was He didn't sing any terrible. other song. Yeah. It's not yeah, like he, he did was, good. Uh, Pierce Brosnan yeah. on yeah. Mamma Mia. Uh huh. <laughs> right. Oh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, Jimmy O'Day, great, great job as King Brian. Uh, Pony Sugru was played by Kieran Moore. And this was his only Disney credit. I looked him up. He played, in, he played opposite Vivian Lee in, a, in the film Anna Karenina, which I haven't seen I haven't either. this version of it. He was Count Vrosky. Yeah. It's like a 19, I feel like late 1940s film. The cast of uh, Bullwhip Griffin. I feel like that actor Pony Sugru. Well, without yeah. But I feel like that kind of character fits in. Yeah. Bullwhip Griffin. Mm -hmm. uh, his, mo his, his mother was Sheila Sugru, or the widow Sugru, as she calls herself. Uh, she was played by Estelle Winwood, and this was her only uh, Disney credit. And she did do a lot of acting in the, in the U S she was in a lot of sitcoms. Uh, she was on the real McCoy's with Walter Brennan. It's just one that I picked out. Mm -hmm. That was a Disney name. Uh, and then a f the next couple are uh, folks that you may have recognized from other British films. So that uh, Disney films. So Lord Fitzpatrick was played by Walter Fitzgerald who who was uh, Squire Trelawney in Treasure Island? You know the, the mm -hmm. big, the kind of the big heavy set dude that that had the had the ship. He went and and, and got the ship. Uh, and then and he was also Hare Hempel in Third Man on the Mountain, which I think was that um, Janet Monroe's grandfather. That, in that one film. I need to rewatch again. Yeah, I do. We we should probably do that film. It's a good one. But uh, uh, Dennis O'Day played Father Murphy, and he was also in Treasure Island. Doctor Livesey. I liked. So, I liked his you know the character. the group. Yeah. Yeah, he had a great character. Yeah. Yeah, I love Treasure Island. That that's one film that I always go back to and watch because it's just such a great escape movie for me. It's a great story. Uh, Tom Kerrigan, play, he was the owner of the Rathcoolin Arms uh, pub and ale house. <laughs> that was, uh, he was played by J.G. Devlin. Uh, and he was in one other Disney film, a television film, but also released overseas called uh, The Guns in the Heather. Or The, yep. uh, the Secret of Boyne Kurt Castle. Yeah. Kurt, yeah, with Kurt Russell. And the last actress that I'm going to mention is uh, Molly Malloy, the, the uh, I guess, quote-unquote, bartender <laughs> at Ralph Cullen Arms, was played by Nora O'Mahony. I just love her, her last Omahomey. name. O'Mahony. Or Mahoney. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so that's the cast. It's such a great cast. And, you know, the... You have to really be, you have to, when you watch this movie, you have to have your popcorn and your drink, your snacks, have to all be ready because the first five to 10 minutes of this film, you meet everybody, you get a great, great you get some great, um, uh, like character development in just that five to 10 minutes. It's just done so well. Like you instantly know that Pony's the villain, you, you love, uh, Darby, you kind of get an idea. Of, like he's kind of a what do you how would how would you um, how would you describe Darby? 
I don't want to say a shyster. A bit. No, a roguish, maybe a little, a little uh, around the rough. Edges. <laughs> He's in, rough around the edges, he's in but kind-hearted. Um, dentistry. Yeah, and so is uh, the, sure. the owner of Rathcorn <laughs> Arms, JG Devlin, and Tom Kerrigan. I guess he's kind of teetering on the edge of being like one hundred percent coherent and a little bit goofy. I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's just yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of. <laughs> I, I I think I I heard that on a podcast, like one of the I think it was uh, Chris's podcast. Like he they did this episode way back in the day when he had Will and Todd on the show, and I think either Will or Todd mentioned that a lot of them needed dental work, so they really represented <laughs> Irish folks well. <laughs> you know, you, you know which Disney character I would say he reminds me of is Lampy. Wait, no, is that his name, Lampy from Pete's Dragon? Uh, um, Mickey Rooney's character. Oh yeah, you're talking about uh, Albert Sharp, or yeah, Lampy. Yeah, sort of sane, but not. But he also isn't driven that, to that, the well, bottle yeah, as much as Lampy but was. Like he, that, he, you would see him like just in the fact yeah. that he's um, but uh, he uh, does know what's going on, but people don't believe him. But they kind of believe him. But yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so uh yeah but it's like in that first 10 15 minutes you, you meet most everybody you kind of get an idea of what the film's going to be about that you know lord fitzgerald is comes into town when he brings michael mcbride with him and and is basically telling darby that dude you're old you can't cut the weeds around my summer house anymore i need a younger guy I'm going to retire you on half pay and you and Katie can live in this other place. But Katie had lived her whole life in the gatehouse and they taken care of the manor house and they had a, a certain position in the town. And so I think he, he felt that she would be crushed, you know, to learn that they had, had to move out and, and kind of start all over from scratch, you know, living on, on half of his salary as the caretaker of the, the manor house or, Lord Fitzpatrick's uh, summer home, I suppose that's what it was. But, uh, you know, and then he starts going into stories about the leprechauns. And, and then we get the plot that, that Pony and his mother are kind of in league to take over Michael McBride's job and then have Pony marry Katie and, and things go on from there. But we'll, we'll talk more about the plot here. Uh, we got another 30 minutes or so to, to go as we talk about our favorite scenes. So um, uh, uh, this is your chance, audience, to, to just briefly mention what your favorite scene is, and, and we'll talk about it. Um, I'm going to scroll back and see. Jay Roxy asks, is there any info about the premiere of the movie in Ireland? You know, I, I meant to look that up today, and I just I, I ran out of time. I did find the photo of it, and I posted it. But, uh, you know, it, I heard it was a really – successful premiere there and lots of folks showed out showed up to to see it but i i don't i don't know if all of the actors were there or they had a great you know lavish premiere like mary poppins or, or happiest millionaire or snow white and the seven dwarfs so i'm not sure <laughs> but uh go ahead and, and you guys can share your favorite scenes uh, with us. And I'll start with Jared. What, what do you got? What's your favorite scene um, of this film? So I do like all the visual scenes with the leprechauns, but I really enjoyed the little scenes. So when I would say when he's trying to convince, I don't remember exactly who he's trying to convince because he tries to convince several people that he has, um, the king in the bag oh i think it's uh, no it's the scene where he has <laughs> this is it it's the scene where sean connery catches him in the woods and he's like um you got to give that up because you're poaching around oh yeah and he keeps look- <laughs> yeah. he thinks he's a poacher and though. he keeps That's looking right. in the bag and every time darby looks in the bag you can see the leprechaun every time sean connery looks in the bag but 
but before that, before that, you get a little bit of his James Bond acting skills because he like flies out of the bushes and tackles yes. Darby like out of nowhere. Yes. <laughs> it's great. It's like, maybe that's what Mr. Broccoli's wife saw. But the acting, yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm so bad. The acting by uh, Jimmy O'Day as King Brian is so great in there because when when Darby looks in. He's just giving him this coy little, it's little old me in this bag. And, but then, you know, Sean Connery looks in and he's like, all mm -hmm. I see is a rabbit. <laughs> right. I, <laughs> it's like, look in with one eye that, that yes, Miss Cater exactly. says, try, try looking in with just one it's, eye. That, that's probably my favorite scene. I mean, they use special effects yeah. there and it's goofy. Yeah, his, his reactions. Yeah, his expressions in in the so bag. Great. You're just like, dude, I'm a rabbit. Hurry up with your last <laughs> wish, bro. I want out of this bag. <laughs> it's just, it's just like, but the way he tricks him is saying like, he, he. Oh, Darby lets it slip. Right. He's his first wish. The second time when he catches him is to like stay with them for a fortnight, which is like a couple weeks. So I can convince everybody in town that I caught you. And when he, he finally gets an opportunity to show him to, to Michael, he's like, oh, I wish you could see him. And, and King Brian's like, that's your second <laughs> wish. <laughs> he can see me. And he's like, he can't see me in yep. my rabbit form. <laughs> so that's like one little moment where Darby kind of loses his wits there. I think it just out of frustration, he lets it that's it. Funny scene. Works out the second wish. Uh, the the cave where Darby's playing. Who actually played the fiddle? That's a great question. So this is Jay Roxy. So we'll, we'll talk about this scene. Because this is the whole, whole circumstance where Darby is, you know, there's this like horse, right? That he goes up. Like every night, I guess they have this issue where they got to get Cleopatra, uh, their horse, the horse back is in the stable. As well, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this horse. And the horse is actually like a puka in Gaelic culture. It's they call it uh, a like a changeling or a shapeshifter type character. And I always wondered if the horse changed into Ginger the cat. Look at you. Be, you know. I always wondered about that. You know, when when he when King Brian tracks down Darby uh, in the mm -hmm. in the in the stable there, he it's the next day. Uh, you know, they do the oh, yeah the whole wishing song game, and then uh, the next day, you know, during the day, the leprechauns have no power, so he can't jump through the wall and escape. <laughs> so. So uh, Darby six his cat Ginger on him to make sure he doesn't run away. <laughs> says, He'll eat you if you try to get away. I always wondered if that was Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Uh, I, I don't know. know. Cleopatra in that scene made, made me laugh because they'd always come. Oh, I know. <laughs> Are those special I effects? So. What, what do you mean? Like her face, the, or is the that... horse's facial reactions? No. No. Oh, I think. Yeah, they're real. Those are I real. I imagine huh? they have some sort of um, trainer who does certain things to get mm -hmm. the shots. But then the editors just picked some of the best shots to coincide with what the jokes were saying. So yeah, mm -hmm. it made me laugh. Yeah. So back to this scene, uh, Darby makes his way down to this cave because you know he's trying to get Cleopatra, and bring them bring her in i guess and then cleopatra mm -hmm. goes nuts you know becomes like the banshee horse or something he, he that reverse negative <laughs> color image thing <laughs> pushes him down this well and it's it's <laughs> it's like that's such a crazy effect of darby like shrinking and swirling around i will Hi, say darby. <laughs> i will say um out of all the special effects in that film i would say that one's probably the least effective but you know yeah. <laughs> yeah, Miss Caters, thank you. You're, she's using the uh, 
the correct verbiage here. He has the come hither put on him because this whole situation with Darby getting fired and losing a situation and Katie probably not going to be too happy about it. So he delays telling her, well, King Brian is like, he puts the come hither on him and says, Hey, you're better off dead <laughs> <laughs> coming down to live with us down here and having fun dancing and playing your fiddle than, than to deal with all of your uh, worldly problems. So, uh, of course, Darby doesn't think so. And he's looking for every excuse to get out of the cave after, of course, being fascinated by jewels and I wanna play, crocs of gold and, I wanna and play the leprechauns dancing. Fiddle, so, um, <laughs> let's go cab it really quick. Okay. You know what I mean? No. Oh, the, I thought you were serious. <laughs> no, that's what his excuses. <laughs> I, do I was not. like, Jared, you play the fiddle? Oh, yeah, he's... Yeah, they ask him to play a song. He's like, well, I've got to – let me go and get my, my own fiddle, right? <laughs> so that's like escape try number one that's unsuccessful because out of nowhere they have this Stradivarius uh, that um, his little lieutenant summons for him. So uh, so Darby, I, I, I looked everywhere for this little piece of information. It, it appears – Years that that Albert Sharp has some serious fiddle playing skills. So, but I could not verify that for you guys. And I know that's the question that um, you asked uh, Jay Roxy, who actually played it. I, I don't know for sure. It, it appears that that he's playing. So I mean, his technique. Like I'm a I'm a, I love classical music. I watch a lot of violinists, and his technique looks pretty good. But I'm not an actual violinist. So. <laughs> it's very convincing. But uh, uh, Caleb, thanks for joining in. Uh, you haven't seen this yet, so I highly recommend you take some time tomorrow to to watch it. You'll love it. It's this yeah this film is way up there on my list of Disney favorites. Like probably top five. I would have to say, oh, maybe at least top 10. It, it's, it's just, it's just full of magic and just amazing. Just awesome. Everybody should watch this film. I, I am a little surprised that it's not as well known, I, but it is on Disney plus and it's just fantastic. Um, so anyways, back to the scene, you know, he plays the fiddle. He plays a song called the Fox chase and out of nowhere, like all these little mini horses show up. <laughs> and uh you know he's he's trying to get the leprechauns to open the mountain so he can get out and which which uh you know the fox mm -hmm. chases just the right song to get them to leave the mountain and so you know king brian says what does he what does he say what's the command in gaelic it's like oh right oh you're asking me to remember that yeah yeah, I can't remember, but whatever he says, the mad, the mountain opens, and it's hilarious. Like Darby's like, "Okay, here's my chance, but first, let me grab some jewels and put them in my pocket." <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the Polar Express effect, right? Where... <laughs> uh, bad example. Random example. <laughs> you know, he puts all the jewels in in a pocket with a hole in it, and they all fall out. But he he gets out. And he goes back into the town, and then uh, the one of Miss Cater's favorite scene. I think way back I saw it. Uh, the wishing song was somebody else's, and that was the next kind of the next scene, right? Where so there's there's the harp. Such a great scene. Like if you're a, into Irish history or Gaelic history, like King Brian shows off all of their their knickknacks that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they came across right through the, through the, through 5,000 years of, uh, of being leprechauns. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, uh, Darby escapes and King Brian's not, you know, that's kind of like, uh, not according to his plan. Right. And he, he felt slighted by Darby and yeah, was he embarrassed, was I guess. Um, yeah, he was mad, so he tracked down Darby. And so when he found Darby, Darby's second plan here to capture him and get his wishes, because originally he had the three wishes, right? And so he wished for, like, health and 
and uh, a crop of potatoes and then a crock of gold for himself. And then um, King Brian's like, okay, well, I'm feeling pretty generous tonight. What's your fourth wish? And then he wishes for a bunch of crocks of gold for his pals. And uh, that's when King Brian laughs and says, can't have four wishes, three wishes, greater small wish for the fourth and you lose them all or something like that <laughs> so darby really wants to catch king brian get the wishes back save his situation you know and so he can buy the manor house and and maybe have katie and michael get married and they can all I live like together that. happily ever after like so friends and family because darby could have easily for the fourth wish um wished for something more for himself but he's like oh well let me just do it for all my yeah. friends. And then he gets screwed over by King Brian. I know. Yeah. And it, it kind of shows what kind of guy he was, you know, because there was the, those, the people that he wished for Crocs of Gold for were always the ones listening really intently mm -hmm. to his stories in the pub. <laughs> like they loved him. They loved his stories. And it, that's just like, I want if I was Irish, I would love to live in that little town. I just, Everybody's, everybody knows each other. Of course, there's the bully and the crazy widow. You know, you're going to have your crazy people. But for the most part, everybody's just chilling in the pub after work, talking about leprechauns Even and the, banshees and uh, stuff. Um, That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, he, even the father comes in for a glass of stout every <laughs> once in a while. Party. Party city. And Katie says... It's a great town. It's small, but we have like dances and parties all night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he may not have been good working all day, but he had a good <laughs> He He's kind of like that guy that did a half a day's work, but felt really good about it and had no problem going to the pub for a, for a glass of stout. So awesome. So the wishing song. So Darby's got him trapped in here, and his plan is to keep him there and get him drunk so he stays in there all night until morning because once it's daylight, he has no uh, power, so he can't escape. So and the wishing song is just mm. great. <laughs> and, and this scene is, like, really fun because it's another example of where, you know, the special effects. And I love when he pours the the uh, poaching into the cup mm -hmm. and gives it to king brian because the cup is like four times his a size of a regular cup and boy he guzzles it down pretty it's good it's a giant basin <laughs> that he just lifts up and downs. <laughs> i mean you gotta think if you fill up a cup with that much liquid in it that's pretty heavy so king brian is Definitely pumps the iron, you know, or he's got that sword that he probably wields around the cave. So <laughs> he, he picked that up like a champ and it he went did. down real easy and cool. Like you said. Yeah. So, you know, they sing like what 80 some odd verses of this song. And like one of my favorite verses, <laughs> I wrote it down. <laughs> it's so funny. He's like, I think uh, this was Darby's verse. It says, oh, I wish I was married to old widow, widow Tunnel. No. To, I'll start. Over. Oh, I wish I was married to old widow Tunny. She's ugly as sin, but has beautiful <laughs> money. <laughs> and they just kind of go back and forth. And <laughs> it's hilarious. And you, lo and behold, it's the next day. And then he throws King Brian in a bag, which is, is a hilarious effect, too, because it's... <laughs> he's totally a puppet, right? He's, yeah, by the end of the 81st verse, like Miss Cater says, he's stacked. Yeah. He's done. So, yeah, that's the wishing song scene. That's so funny. So, one of my favorite scenes is the very beginning, like the opening title. Uh, J. Yeah. Roxy, thanks for coming in. Yeah, it's all we're gonna stop here in about 10, 10 minutes, too. So, uh, yeah, it's 10 30 where I'm at, it's 8 20. But thanks for your, yeah, <laughs> but thanks for sharing your favorite scene, and and we loved having you. So, and I'll post the rest of this on YouTube so you can listen to the last few minutes. But my favorite scene is the uh, opening titles. I 
I just love those. I mean, you get that great mm -hmm. Oliver Wallace score, like the the instrumental to Pretty Irish Girl, and it's just so Disney to me. Just such such a magical opening. The you get that great shot of the village, and it's just like it just sets sets the mood. Like like you're in for well, a great you Disney said it film. Earlier, it's and then a thank you note at the beginning as well. Yeah, that note, you're like, oh, leprechauns are real? Mm -hmm. This is going to be awesome. And you kind of forget, like for me, I kind of forget that I'm watching a movie. Once the names scroll on, the, on, you know, you see these actor names. Of course, in this film, they're mostly new, unless you're really familiar with some of the British films. And you adore Janet Monroe and Sean Connery. Like, who doesn't? And Albert Sharp is awesome. I mean... After you've seen this movie several times, you just love this cast. Um, and so you're just, it's like 93 minutes of family time. Even seeing all the names of the folks that worked on the film are just like, oh, mm -hmm. Pete Allen Shaw, mm -hmm. Eustace Slice, and, and, and uh, you know, all these names that, that have done such great work. You're just like, oh, man, I can't wait for this again. You get excited. And it's just got a great opening sequence. And I love that, you know, it just rolls right on into the story and, and you just, and the music really just makes it for me. So that's, that's one of my favorites. So uh, you have another one? Uh, the other one would have been the, the, the song with when the horse was making like the eye rolls and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, Jim mentioned a scene. Okay, and it's a good timing for this one. He he liked the death coach scene. So at the end of the movie, right, um, it's kind of like uh, everything kind of comes together where Pony shows up and he's, he, he's got this plan where he beats up Sean Connery uh, and, and pours a bunch mm -hmm. of whiskey on him makes him look like a drunk and not very convincing because uh darby he's like no nah, you know he's not that kind of guy but uh uh anyways that night uh cleopatra gets loose right and katie's now off to try to bring him bring her back and so she off screen gets uh uh thrown or something. like maybe she got on cleopatra because if you watch the I captured the king of the leprechauns. One of the stories in there is the horse throws the rider off and dies. And mm. it's kind of like what we see happen to Katie, but off screen. I think that's what happened. She got thrown off against the rocks and was knocked unconscious. And so that's when, yeah, Miss Cater said it. The banshee is coming. You know, whenever the banshee shows up, that means someone's about to die. And I guess it's Katie's time. And so they take her back home and she's lying in bed and the priest is there and, and, uh, the band and she shows up again and, and, uh, Darby like wax the banshee with a shovel to... or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She takes off and, and, uh, so meanwhile, Darby's got this last wish and it's time to use it because here comes the Costa Bauer or the death coach for Katie. And he's like, um, oh, thanks, Ryan. Glad you're here. Hope you had a great day at work at Disney World where you work. Um, yeah, the Banshee, how? Isn't that freaky? And when, he, when the Banshee shows up to the door and you finally see the Banshee's face, mm -hmm. that's like cover mm -hmm. your kid's eyes, people. Scary as heck. Um, yeah, so that's just nuts. But, you know, this is where we, we see Darby as uh, you know, how much he loves Katie and would do anything for her. He takes the last wish. And this is kind of moving, I think to King Brian, where he, he tells King Brian, Hey, I wish for the death coach to take me instead. Yeah. I mean, that whole scene with the death coach coming down, that is probably the most well done visual effect. Uh, yeah. It's in, really in the good. movie. It's so realistic looking. Yeah, I mean, it's legit scary, like frightening. Like, I, I, it freaks me out 
to be honest. I get well, like I the wonder, hair stands up on I my wonder, arms like, like when I watch it. Kids in 1959 are going to watch this movie. What they think? Unfortunately, kids today, this it's minor compared to other stuff that they see in kids' movies. Yeah. But in I yeah. in 1959, where you don't see special effects like that all the time, um, I mm -hmm. just wonder how scared they truly were. Yeah. Well, I think maybe folks in our generation or a little older can can appreciate this a little bit more because we grew up with these kind of effects. And I mean, I know when I watch like movies like Poltergeist or Exorcist or something right. like that, it's still scary, but it's almost right. comical right. sometimes <laughs> compared to what you see nowadays. Uh, uh, yeah, so continuing on with the story. So Darby, he's like, that, that that's so freaking scary too is when the coach arrives and and it's always the that said yeah the headless coach right the headless coachman or sometimes it's in gaelic culture history it's he's on a horse like a headless horseman uh but he's like, like darby o'gill like can you just imagine like if it's your your time to go and you hear that like <laughs> all right this is it yeah it is <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm dead. Get in, yeah. So he gets in, and then they're traveling off. And then King Brian shows up, and he's like, "Darby, you know, I'm I I just I can't believe you did this." So they get to talking, and and then you you kind of know, <laughs> Miss Skaters, you're cracking me up <laughs> uh, with the headless, yeah. Crazy, I know. I want to see the death coach come down Main Street for the Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween um, Parade. How about that? And then have the coach open up and tell the kids, get oh in. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yep. And then like Miss Cater says in the chat, King Brian totally tricked him into the fourth wish, his plan, which meant that, uh, you know, I, I get, what did he say? He's like, I wish I can go with you to the, uh, the other side and, and, and like uh, Darby, who's just kind of like, you know, just he's accepted his fate. It's like, yeah, I wish you could, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, he's like, he laughs and like, all right, all the wishes are gone. Yeah. They, they had such a great friendship. It, you really see that in this scene. It's touching. And uh, so, you know, at that moment when Darby got out of the coach, Katie was miraculously healed and they end up, uh, Fighting each other or not? <laughs> <laughs> There's a big brawl down in Brad Coolin. Everybody's going out. <laughs> no, they they decide uh, Sean Connery or Michael McBride. It, it's time for him to to get rid of Pony because that's kind of an unfinished uh, 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 thing going on there. They need to tie that up. So he uh, knocks out Pony in the in the Rath Coolin arms. <laughs> And uh, thankfully, it wasn't as as a uh, brutal a fight scene like the last scene in, in Happiest Millionaire where they destroy the bar. Because I would hate to see that happen to the Wrath Coolin Arms. It's such a cool spot. Yeah, but it was it's it's fine yeah. if you sing while doing it. Yeah, yeah. They didn't they didn't sing. Uh, um, well, what's well, the song? Well, let's have a drink on it. <laughs> Yeah, let's have a drink on it. Yeah, it's just it was it was over pretty quick because of course that's he's going up against James Bond there, so not much True. of a Plus, shot. I don't think Tony they were had. going for a roadshow edition. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. And by the time the fight starts, you know that there's like only two minutes left in the movie, so it's got to end quick. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, the quiet man. Yeah, that's, that's a rough one. <laughs> that's a little bit more, um, a little more brutality going on in that one than, than uh, Darby. So, uh, you know, they sing pretty Irish girl and boy and, and run off in the cart to go finish cutting the rest of the weeds at the manor house because they're all going to work together and live happily ever after. So that's uh, Darby O'Gill and the little people. I, I, do you have any fun facts you want to share? We kind of 
yeah, talked about like all the ones I have written did. down. Um, I, okay. I have one. Uh, Janet Monroe won a 1960 Golden Globe oh, for New Star of the Year. Uh, possibly this, and I know Third Man on the Mountain was released later in 1959, so it may have been for her work in both films. But, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did not know that. And we already talked about the dubbing in the 69 version. Yeah, no, I, no, I, don't I don't have don't anything either. else. <laughs> I, it just was a really yeah. fun one to watch. I will suggest that mm -hmm. if it's showing anywhere around you um, on the big screen, go see it. It really is fun. And I feel like yeah. maybe it's a little bit too late, but I would check. I mean, this is the perfect time of year for it to be popping up on big screens or art houses throughout the country. I've, I've seen it like on Instagram. I've seen people post before in years past, like we're going to see Darby O'Gill or they're bringing it to our theater here. So I would seek it out. It's a good one. Hello. Oh, uh -huh. okay. yep, I'm here. Sorry. My, my, <laughs> oh. my son peeked in. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I would love to see this on the big screen, but I just have to settle with this. I, everybody has to watch this film, and uh, it, it's just so good. Great movie for St. Patrick's Day. Everybody gets a crock of gold for joining in. Yep, if uh, you DM me uh, your address, I'll send you the crock of gold. No problem. Actually, I'll probably just have Jared crock take care of, of that. I'm right on top of that, Rose. <laughs> yeah, right on top. And uh, yeah, you can go grab the crocs. Uh, Ryan uh, she had a well, that's why I ran out. So there you go. I had this one on display. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll do this next St. Patrick's Day, the Fighting Prince of Donegal. With uh, Susan Hampshire and uh, yep. Peter McHenry. Good one to revisit. Yeah, I like this movie. It's not. It's it's not very well. Uh, it's. I really love Disney or set. Seems like in England, Ireland, you know, Greece, uh, Scotland, like Greyfriar Bobby. That's another good one. Um. Yeah. That'll do it. Thanks, Jared, for uh, for uh, me tonight. I know you're busy, but I appreciate you coming out to do this, and I'll I'll let you go so you can get back to work. <laughs> well, thank you. No, that was it was really fun. It, yeah. it was a good like I said, yeah. it's a good one to revisit. So any any yeah, always a good one to watch this time of year. Any parting shots from the chat? Here? I will say. I'll Can do a I little plug for myself. I made a video that I put out on my Instagram last week, um, a little montage video that I really enjoyed doing. And if you haven't watched it, you should take a look. It's, um, I put a clip of all title cards for all, all of the live action Disney films into a montage. And um, it's yeah, a really it's great, awesome. like, I think it, I, I think it's just going to remind people of so many different movies that maybe they forgot about or that they didn't know about. So it's pinned at the top of my Instagram page. So selfless mm -hmm. plug. Selfish <laughs> you plug. Pinned it. And I'll, I'll share it. I'll, I'll, I'll share it. Buddy, uh, thank you, Walt. And thanks, Albert Sharp. And Jimmy O'Day and Janet and Sean and for all your awesome work. Mm -hmm. If any of you are out there, if Sean Connor, well, everybody's gone the way of the Banshee and the death coach in this film anyways. But uh, we sure appreciate you making this film and it's out there for generations to keep enjoying. So all of you with kids, watch this with your kids, um, you know, cover their eyes during the Banshee scene or whatever but but keep these movies alive for folks to enjoy 
uh, on down the road. And we'll see you next month. I think we're going to try to do Tron next month. <laughs> yeah, Sean Connor was probably here. Yep. <laughs> so we'll let you know uh, if we can do Tron. I know we're both kind of busy uh, next month. Yeah, we've it's got a lot not going on, but yeah, uh, it, we're still planning on. We don't get to it. It's not because we don't want to. <laughs> yeah. But we are planning on visiting Disney yeah. World in May. Uh, that's still on the table. And uh, we are going to experience the Tron attraction at that time. And, and we'd like to do Tron before we go because that'll give us an excuse to really dive deep into the movie and then maybe catch all the Easter eggs that they have for out sure. there at the attraction. So, um, yeah, for sure. So thanks, everyone. Good night. Uh, we will uh, see you guys next month. If not in May, when we're at Disney World, we did we do plan on doing like a short live yep. video while we're out there. Um, but uh, Goodbye, thanks everyone. again, everybody. Yes. Watch Darby. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Take care. Everybody have a great night.